Hello again, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We are bringing you volume three of our SIP Shelter in Place series on the STIR. I'm your host, Trish Moiko Tobin. And I'm once again joined by film and entertainment guru, sitcom producer and author, Debbie Baldwin. Hey, Debbie. Hey, Trish. How's it going? Chugging along. We're getting a routine in place. <laughs> We're not all driving each other crazy, so. A routine in this day and age, as strange as it sounds. Yeah, you're right about that. Um, yeah. So Debbie and I, for this edition, we are here to entertain and inform, and of course, hopefully brighten your day as we all do our part by staying at home during this pandemic to help keep everyone safe. So for today's show, I'm having Debbie take the wheel as she brings us her top 10 list of great movies that you probably haven't seen. Actually, we've got 11 movies, right, Deb? <laughs> and don't, like, the longer you talk, I'm mentally adding them to the list <laughs> as you go, <laughs> so now it might be 12. <laughs> so, something special for today's show. I actually have visual aids for everybody so they can, <laughs> so they can follow along. So I knew that you were top 11 films. See, I have to get used to holding these signs up so everyone can follow along. And, um, and also, before we get started, it's important to note that these films can be easily found on a lot of the streaming services, Hulu, Amazon, Hulu, Amazon Prime, Apple. YouTube. A couple of them are on Netflix. So Deb, I'm going to turn it over to you. What's the, the number? And, and also good to note that these are in no particular order except for alphabetical order, just to give us some semblance of, of organization here. Deb, what's the first sure. film? Uh, the first film is a film called Away We Go, which is a John Krasinski and Maya Rudolph film. They star as a young couple. Um, they are unmarried, but they're in a committed relationship. And they discover, much to their surprise, one day that they are having a baby. And to, they both feel that they have poor parent, parenting examples. And so they head off on this cross-country adventure to visit their friends who have kids and see their parenting styles and determine how, what kind of parents they're going to be. And um, it's John Krasinski's mother is played by Catherine O'Hara, who... I saw that list for the cast, and I can't wait to see, one, because the cast is unbelievable. We unbelievable. have Jeff Daniels as well. Um, yeah, Jeff Daniels and um, Al Allison Janney just plays the sort of day drinking soccer mom, <laughs> you know, fed up, you know, to a, t I mean, it's just double overlapping. And then the, who, the, the actor who really steals the movie is Maggie Gyllenhaal, who plays an independently wealthy college professor with a, um, a, conti a continuum household, I think it's called, where they have an, an open bed that their children all share their bed with them. She is opposed to strollers because she feels that they push your child away from you. And I mean, it. she just nails the role and the way they play with her sure. is really, really funny. And it's just also on top of all that, a really heartwarming story of the love story between the two main characters. So I know, really I love the premise of this movie ever since you mentioned it to me, um, you know, uh, from the onset and the fact that the leads are played by two really lovable actors, Maya Rudolph, really? John Krasinski. And also I was surprised to find out that this was directed by Sam Mendes. Mm -hmm. He of um, American Beauty, Road to Perdition, and most recently 1917. Yeah, it's, and these little films, and you think, and you know, I, I didn't realize it myself, and then you're looking through the cast information and the crew information, and you're like, oh my, you know, you forget that these great, great directors and filmmakers and actors, you know, did some really incredible little projects that either launched their careers or, you know, were, were 
pet projects or whatever. But anyway, it's a lot of fun to kind of go back and look over these films. Well, it's near the top of my list. Again, you know, ever since you mentioned it, I mean, I have to say as a disclaimer for our viewers and our listeners that half these films I haven't seen and that's kind of what's so exciting about this show because I'm learning right along with you. This next film though I have seen and I love it. Beautiful Girls. Beautiful Girls is <laughs> this very high budget podcast with our <laughs> <laughs> I'm with telling our, you our we go all out we go all out. <laughs> um is a, a Timothy Hutton plays um, a jazz pianist who goes back to his um, small town in Canada for a visit to discover his old group of high school friends have were kind they, of um, headed to a high school reunion. That was the uh, the whole thing. They yeah. were getting together, I believe. Yes, yes. and um, the supporting cast. It's really if you loved movies like. Um, um okay keep going an incredible supporting cast including Mira Sorvino and Uma Thurman and Michael Rappaport but the really charming aspect of Beautiful Girls is Timothy Hut Hutton's friendship that he forms with this young teenage girl uh, who's a self-proclaimed old soul who's his next door neighbor and played incredibly by very young Natalie Portman Natalie so Portman. It, yes, yes. Um, her giving him romantic advice and life advice, and it just gives that movie that little extra, um, something extra that, you know, a film like that kind of needs to separate itself from the pack. The Beautiful Girls is a great story with incredible acting and, you know, lots of relationship drama. So we were talking about films that reminded us of something of this genre where you have these pretty much film superstars coming together and, and forming a great ensemble cast is The Big Chill. The Big Chill. That's yeah. it. Which is, I mean, iconic. It's hard to compare any film to The, great, the Big Chill, but Beautiful Girls has that kind of ensemble vibe of old friends and lots of old wounds being reopened and healed and you know, unresolved relationships and romance. So in that sense, yes, it's, it's like that. But And really I, um, I recall it came out in the mid nineties and 90s. I just recall the soundtrack of this particular movie was just so unbelievably good. I mean, you have everyone from Neil Diamond, Barry White and Chris Isaac all in one soundtrack. And it was such a memorable part of the film. Definitely, the music is a huge part of it. Really great soundtrack, no question. The next movie on the list is Big Fish. I which, love, love, love that movie. And I will tell you, when I first saw this uh, film in the theater, I said to myself, this movie's gonna win the Academy Award. How that film escaped the notice of the Academy is, absolutely beyond me it is such an incredible also if parents are looking for a family film it has that kind of princess bride feel um very much like a fantasy but with a really poignant message um albert brooks plays a dying father uh billy crudup plays his estranged son who comes back to visit him and part of the reason the father and son have had this falling out is that the, fa <clears throat> the father has a tendency to tell these tall tales. And it frustrates the son to no end that he feels that he really doesn't know his father. But as the film evolves, you start to see, I mean, it's getting me a little choked up. It's such a beautiful story. Oh, I completely that, agree. Um, it was one of those movies that is just so unforgettable on many levels. Just the story itself, you're right. It has this feel of like a, a fairy tale kind of thing, like a, a fable yeah. almost. And um, I believe it was like 2003 when it came out. And um, Oh gosh, and then the one thing, uh, the one reference in the movie that I just always remember every spring when the daffodils come out 
is when they talk about the field of daffodils because that was uh, that played yeah. a really, really um, just very touching, moving part in the movie. I totally agree. And if you, I mean, when the credits roll in that movie, if you are not smiling and crying at the same time, I'm, I would be amazed. It's such a satisfying, beautiful film. And these tall tales that the father tells of the son kind of comes to the realization that they're not as tall as he may have thought. And that, you know, there's a certain magic that the father was kind of bestowing upon his son. It's a great movie. Great. I know, you're right. It, it's giving me chills. Once again, every time I see this movie, and I've seen it more than two or three times, I cry. I mean, but it's it's that kind of cry where it's melancholy, bittersweet. It's just a sweet, sweet film. I love the cast. Um, Albert Finney, he, I thought he was perfect for this role. And Ewan McGregor plays the character as a young man. Young so you Albert, yeah. Double, yeah. yeah, it's great. And we have, um, uh, the cameos are wonderful too. Our, our favorite guy, Steve Buscemi, has a cameo. Um, Helena Bonham Carter, Danny DeVito. Um, just a, a really solid, solid cast all around as well. Yes, it's fantastic. Agreed, totally. All right, um, so the next film we have, Debbie, I am unfamiliar with this movie. All I know is that it was indeed a movie. But um, okay. tell us all about it. All the movies on the list, this is the one I would have thought would have been most up your alley. Um, really? Cold, Cold <laughs> Comfort Farm uh, is a British film that um, is, a, a, it's hard to describe. It's almost like it's a parody of a British kind of gothic not gothic, that's sort of the wrong example. Well, in, in, um, like a Jane Austen parody almost. Okay, about you've got my attention there. <laughs> her ancestral farm and the hijinks that ensue. It's about a young British woman who, um, whose parents die unexpectedly and she chooses uh, relatives to live with until she marries. Okay. And so she chooses this very sort of quirky, um, distant relatives um, in, uh, you know, in the outskirts of, of London. And um, it, it's just this wacky family. And it's all set in, you know, that very sort of early 20th century. Okay. Um, and uh, it's just smart and witty and laugh out loud. I mean, I... I don't want to oversell it, but it it really lives up to your expectations. You've got me entry, definitely. Having just recently seen um, Sense and Sensibility, which is what, a 20, 25-year-old film. Mm -hmm. And I loved it, but I thought it went on for too long. It was a two and a half hour film. I'm ready for a film like this. <laughs> yeah, this one is just it's sort of, you know, you get the distinct sense that the film, that the filmmaker's kind of nudging you and winking throughout the film and you're, I mean, it's just, it's a wacky film, but it's, it's very, very entertaining. Got it. All right. So your next film is, I even hesitate to call it a baseball movie because it's a lot more than that, but it's Eight Men Out from 1988. And that is John Sayles, uh, the director, who is one of my all-time favorite directors. Um, it is his, uh, version of the events that led up to the Chicago Black Sox scandal in 1919, 20, the 1919 World 1919 Series. Chicago Black Sox, uh, Black Hawks, Black Sox, <laughs> where the Chicago White Sox were accused of being on the take to fix the World Series. Right. And, um, the cast is incredible, including John Cusack. I mean, I can't even drum up all the actors that uh, make up the actual baseball players on the team. It was Clifton James, Michael Lerner, um, Charlie Sheen, like I said, D.B. Sweeney, Christopher Lloyd. I mean, it was a pretty all-star cast and... Um, yeah, and um, I'm trying to look and see who um, the most Sorry, I'm just, you know, D.B. Sweeney, also one of my favorite actors. Yeah. 
um, who plays, in my mind, the most interesting character in the film, which is Shoeless Joe Jackson, who was the poorest player, the player with arguably the most reason to take a bribe. And this, this story, as it's told, he is guilty by association. And it's a very moving story from his perspective. And it's a fascinating story from the whole, um, from Comiskey, you know, down to the coaches, to the players, and just how everything unfolded in right. know, this story version of events. I get, so, I, yeah, I completely agree. And, you know, to call it a baseball movie is, is not doing it any, any favor. It's just a, a great, it, even though you know the outcome of, of what eventually uh, happened, it's still an edge of your seat kind of film that you're glued to, you know, to every frame, every minute, and the actors are so compelling. I remember just, you know, seeing that in the theater for the first time is really something that I enjoyed. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a great film. I mean, I'll see anything John Sales made, but this movie in particular stands out for me. It's just a great, great sports film and a great drama all, all around. Right. Now, speaking of uh, edge of your seat types of movies and suspenseful, suspenseful movies, this one kicks it up a few notches in its identity, again with John Cusack um, from 2003. Identity is the definition of a psychological thriller. I mean, if you are looking for a great edge of your seat, devour the popcorn, stormy night movie, Identity is your film. It's ostensibly the story of a group of people who get reined in at a, I mean, it is a complete, it was a dark and stormy night set up. Right. Um, you know, almost typical, which is so great because it kind of eases you into this, like, what's this going to be? And I can remember seeing the theater and thinking, this film is either going to, you know, be like a balloon slowly letting out air or a I just hit the jackpot of great thrillers and it, I'm, you know, not going to give anything away about this film <laughs> set up like a whodunit where characters. And I believe it was inspired by um, Agatha Christie's um, and then there were none. Uh -huh. uh -huh. yeah. And then, which is, you know, one by one, people are getting murdered at this motel, a very spooky motel and you don't know why or who. And so we'll leave it at that. But if you want a good, a good thriller, good psychological thriller, Identity is the movie for you. Well, it's been a while since I've seen it, but the two of us talking about this just recently, I want to see it again because it was really that good. I remember, I remember being really, really drawn to it. So switching gears a little bit in terms of genre, we've got a 2005 film uh, next on your list, Just Like Heaven. Just Like Heaven is it, I, um, if you're looking for a straight up romantic comedy, this was a largely overlooked film that stars Reese Witherspoon and Mark Ruffalo. Reese plays um, an aspiring doctor. She's, I think she's a resident and she is hit by a car and um, killed. Or, I mean, they, you don't really know for sure, but they, she's not going to survive, they don't think. And Mark Ruffalo, you know, after a long period in a coma, the family sells her San Francisco apartment, which is this fabulous um, right. part, rooftop apartment with a garden up above. And the person who rents the apartment is, um, played by Mark Ruffalo. And Who's sure enough- Who's basically widowed. Who is widowed and, it, uh, right. And so he, um, Reese is haunting the apartment, is this the it's long and short pretty much the setup, yeah. <laughs> and so she is trying to get him to help her. Um, I, I mean, I, I, explaining it only makes it sound sort of ridiculous but it is so charming and the actors are the complete reason the movie works and i completely agree because i Mark saw it when it came out 
Yeah, I mean, it was such a sweet movie, and I'm a big Mark Ruffalo fan anyway. Me too. Yeah, yeah. so, um, yeah. And then his, his, boy, boy, his best friend, who's played by Donna Logue, is <laughs> hilarious. So <laughs> it's a great, a great pairing there. Because right. you've got this kind of edgy actor in Donna Logue who doesn't seem to ever really give a crap about anything, and then Mark Ruffalo is an intensely vulnerable actor and it's really fun to watch them together on screen. Yes, yes, I, I, I love that movie and I do remember seeing that. So that was my goodness, 15 years ago now. Um, but yeah, I, I just remember that it's a really, really sweet film. And um, yes, I was happy to see that on your list. So we're going way back to 1995 for your next film. It's called The Last Supper, but we wanna make sure this is not a Mel Gibson Passion of the Christ no. movie, nor is it anywhere close to the uh, Da Vinci art uh, masterpiece. But tell us a little bit about The Last Supper, Deb. Far, far it. from it. And I will say I had some reservations about putting this on the list because it's, it deals with the sort of divisive nature of our society uh, politically. And so if you have are already rolled your eyes, <laughs> skip over this film because it <laughs> completely addresses this headbutting politically that goes on in the world, in the US. And so the story is five uh, very idealistic, very smart liberal college students or grad students have an encounter um, with it starts off with a truck driver who's I think played by Jeff Daniels if I'm remembering correctly and um, they invite he helps them helps one of the characters out of a jam and they end up inviting him over for dinner and he is offensive um, beyond politically he's a huge racist it's I mean and anyway blah one thing leads to another and he ends up getting killed at their at their home which gives this group an idea. <laughs> they are gonna one by one pick off very right wing people that they deem the world would be better off without. And so it's- Can you just see that light bulb idea collectively right. <laughs> coming right. over them? <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's a very dark, a very intelligent examination of free speech and the end justifying the means and uh, tolerance. I mean, it, and it's funny and the cast includes a young Cameron Diaz and um, Ron you know, Eldard, Ron Eldard from ER and Jason uh, Alexander and Brian Dennehy. I mean, it's a very well acted Courtney Vance. Um, Courtney Vance, I think it must be one of his first roles. Yeah, but, 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 yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's a very, very black comedy, but uh, uh, it's definitely one. not for everybody, but there are right. people that are into um, right. this particular subject matter that and I think, you know, they will find right that way. Cool. Yeah. yeah, there's no surprises. <laughs> this is what it's about. Like, if, you <laughs> if you're not interested in that, don't watch this film. Right, right. So moving on, the 2005 film Prime, which I am, I have to admit, I'm unfamiliar with. I completely missed that when it came out. Now, the movie came out, um, it's a, I mean, to call it a romantic comedy, I would call it a straight comedy. Um, it is the story of Uma Thurman, who is an artist in her late 30s, and she has begun a relationship with a much younger man. And they have both lied about their ages. So while in reality, the man is 23 and Uma Thurman's character is 37, they think they are 27 and 34. Okay. So, but Uma Thurman has gone to her therapist to discuss this age difference and this relationship and her qualms and her excitement to her therapist who is played by Meryl Streep. Exactly. And 
as it turns out, and this is not a spoiler because this is the, the basis of the comedy of the entire film, the man in question is Meryl Streep's son. Of course. So, and then hijinks ensue. <laughs> yes, and I will say this, Meryl Streep has done comedies before and you know we've all seen The Devil Wears Prada. I mean, she's done some great work in comic films, Death Becomes Her. This is more, she is not, she is the source of the comedy in this film as opposed to <laughs> okay. you know, other films where she's more the straight man. I think that um, it, it's 100% worth watching. Don't focus too much on the propriety of the therapist counseling a patient who's dating her own son. Just enjoy the movie because it's a movie. That's <laughs> incredible. The acting, the comedy is priceless and it's just kind of a cute story. So that's a, I think, a great film. Okay, wonderful. Another one I haven't seen and I'm very curious about. I do remember this coming out in the theater. It's called Side Effects from 2013 and it's a Steven Soderbergh film. It is. And um, Side Effects is uh, a, another great thriller. Um, it stars um, Channing Tatum and um, Rooney Mara. And um, she uh, and Jude Law and Catherine Data Jones. And she, <clears throat> it's about, it's, uh, now this one would have a spoiler alert, so I'm not going to give away the plot, but okay. Rooney Mara and Channing Tatum are a married couple and she, he has been at the, in the very first scene, they are living in this fabulous Greenwich estate, uh, the life, you know, life of Riley, just everything is perfect. And the feds pull up to the driveway oh. in the middle of the garden party. And sure enough, Channing Tatum is arrested for some sort of uh, insider trading or white collar crime. Okay. And so you fast forward <clears throat> to him getting out and now they're living in a very modest apartment and sh the wife uh, who's played by Rooney Mara is, had been battling depression and taking different medications to try and get her condition under control. Several people then get involved, including Jude Law, who plays uh, her doctor, and is trying to figure out what about this medication created, what side effect of this medication caused homicidal behaviors, basically. Okay. But, there's a lot of twists and turns and it's, um, you know, so interesting to see how this unfolds. It's I mean, just the casting itself was interesting to me. When I first saw Channing Tatum's name, I, I just immediately um, assumed that it was some kind of comedy, but not at all. No, it's a very good thriller. Okay. That will keep you guessing for sure. Well, go figure. I mean, Steven Soderbergh's not necessarily known for comedy anyway. <laughs> that should have been my know, first clue. And, and people kind of let that that movie blow by, kind of not really paying attention. And then all of a sudden you think, oh, well, you know, everything, if, I mean, sure, everyone's watching Steven Soderbergh's Contagion right now. Right. But this, is a, this is a great, another great film from him that it was, uh, sort of flew under the radar, but it's definitely worth watching. All right, so in terms of definitely worth watching, last but not least, we've gotten to film number 11 from 1993, So I Married an Axe Murderer. If you have not seen this film and you want to absolutely, I can't tell you, there's only a handful of films really that will make me just laugh until I'm about ready to fall over, like laugh until it hurts. And <laughs> This is, if you take, you know, all the Animal House, the Bill Murray movies, the Mel Brooks, the Monty Pythons, and then, you know, this, in my mind, is right there as far as laughs go. And Mike Myers plays a commitment phobe 
guy living in San Francisco, and <clears throat> he uh, also plays in the film his own Scottish father, which oh. <laughs> is enough in and of itself to have you laughing just hysterically with the relationship between his parents. Now, meanwhile, he meets a woman who he's very, very taken with. She is a butcher at the kind of little local corner butcher shop where he lives, she is. You know, paid by Nancy Travis. Wow, and okay. Meanwhile, the mother, who's also Scottish, uh, Mike Myers' mother, is her, what she considers to be the paper, have you read the paper this morning, is the weekly world news, which is that outrageous, you know, alien abduction tabloid. And so she's <laughs> explaining to her son that there's a woman, Mrs. X, who is marrying men and murdering them for her, their fortunes. It's sort of a, she's explaining to him this black widow. She says, look, you know, a, a karate instructor in Pittsburgh and a physician in Dallas and a fireman in Milwaukee or whatever. And she's, <laughs> and, you know, Mike Myers' character is kind of like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And he's slowly in, in his way of always finding an excuse to break up with whoever he's dating, decides that this woman is the ax murderer who's marrying <laughs> men and killing them for their fortunes. So he's at, at the end at the same time, he's falling in love with her. So it's, I can't, I've, I'll say no more. It's just Mike Myers at his absolute best. <laughs> Classic and, love story, it sounds like it. Right, exactly. <laughs> and, but it's, everything about it is funny. Every scene is funny. It never drags. It's, and it's also very charming. He's Mike Myers. You know, you forget that he's an attractive guy. I think they see talking about another guy. Um, we could probably do an entire show on him. I've probably seen every movie he's been in, except for this one. Yeah. Which, you know, I understand has a, a cult following, but I have never seen it. I can remember seeing it. And right as I walked out of the theater, I called my brother, who is the biggest comedy snob I've ever met in my life. I called him <laughs> in Los Angeles and said, you need to go see So I Married an Axe Murderer. And he was like, it's that good? I go, go right now. He goes, okay. He called me like three hours later. He said, I did. It's hilarious. He said, that is one of the funniest movies I've ever seen. You started spouting lines at me. And you know, like, when you have a great comedy with people that you share that love of that film with, and you're just spurting lines back and forth, it's just the greatest. And this is one of those films where you Okay, think, oh, you sold me on that. <laughs> well, you know, you guys who are watching at home, in case you're wondering, Debbie had 50 or more films, and we had to tell her to narrow it down to 10. Well, well, 11. <laughs> uh, last night, just on a whim, uh, my husband and I rewatched Along Came Polly, which oh, is yeah. Ben Stiller and Jennifer Aniston, <laughs> Deborah Messing, and Philip Seymour Hoffman. And I, I remember watching it the first time. I think Jennifer Aniston was so overexposed at the time. Yes. And I really kind of was lukewarm on that film. But boy, watching it again, if you're looking for a great romantic comedy, I mean, it follows the formula perfectly. Um, ben Stiller plays a risk management guy for an insurance company <laughs> who marries a woman he thinks is the perfect woman for him, played by right. Deborah Messing in a, in a cameo. Yeah. And on night one of their honeymoon, in a hilarious cameo, Hank Azaria kind of steals her away as the nude beach diving instructor in St. Bart's. <laughs> and so Ben Stiller is trying to put his life back together and he right. runs into uh, Polly, who is this very flighty girl. With flighty is, is a good word for that character. <laughs> pants kind of girl, the exact opposite of what he thinks he wants. And as you can imagine, it's... Exactly. But I mean, I that is a... You know, you think romantic comedies, they're always missing one or the other. They're either romantic, but not that funny, or right. they're really funny, but it's they're not It's a hard romantic. balance, it you is. know, and then you throw in your particular taste in terms of the storyline, right. the actors. It's, it's really a very tricky formula, and 
And when you find something like this, and I do remember seeing that movie, it's, it's such a sweet movie. And again, yes. Stiller, he's another one of those guys where, you he know, we can no talk wrong. ever. <laughs> I, know. I mean, I was, and I was thinking, um, as I was seeing Catherine O'Hara in Away We Go, you know, who also stars right now in Schitt's Creek with her, with yes. her best in show co-star Eugene Levy, you know, that, that there's, that's a whole other body of films, those, you know, Waiting for Guffman, Best in Show, A Mighty Wind. Oh my gosh, you're right. And I mean, it's just, we could go on and on and on. I mean, it's, 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 it's crazy. <laughs> there's so many, and, and yet, you know, you feel like you sit down in front of Netflix or in front of your streaming service and you're like, I need a movie. You know, I, I need a good recommendation. And but. you, in fact, are offering a public service here. <laughs> but, but you guys can see the problem here with Debbie. You know, we have to corral her because you give her a topic and then she goes off. And, um, but there's so many movies and you've seen so many of them, my goodness. Um, so we couldn't possibly bring you everything in this show, but we promise there's gonna be more and we would love for you to be part of the conversation. So um, follow us on Facebook, at Gazelle Magazine, Twitter, and also Instagram. Give us any of your ideas. If there's anyone or any movie that we missed, uh, let us know, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. So we always like to close the show on a sweet treat. And this week, yes, Deb, we're gonna seriously do- seriously been talking fast so that you would get to this <laughs> picture you posted. It looks so good. Well, okay, so this is actually something on the healthier side because we are making it with fruit. And because I, um, you know, I'm gonna go all out with my visual aids, I wanna show you my featured fruit, which is a mango. I scored on some fresh mangoes it when I went like to field potato. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a mango. It's not it's not a potato. I'm like, this is not gonna taste good at all. It's a mango. Okay, a mango. Particularly it's champagne mango, but you can use any kind of mango. All um the dessert itself is called mango float. And um Think of it as a tiramisu that's made with fruit. And the ingredients are pretty simple. You know, mangoes, you can find them at any grocery store, really. Or you could also um, use canned peaches, if you're into peaches, because peaches are not in season right now. You may also use fresh strawberries or fresh kiwi. And pretty much what it is, is the fruit, you layer it with some graham crackers, some whipping cream that you whip up, and some condensed milk to sweeten it and you layer all that and chill for a little bit in the fridge and you've got this lovely, fluffy, cloudy yumminess and it is irresistible. Is the condensed milk a separate layer all just on its own? No, when you whip the, when you whip the oh. whipping cream, um, you kind of fold it in there after it, you know, it forms the peaks and um, oh. that's one layer. So it's really fruit, graham crackers and the whipped cream and you repeat again and um, you know, um, we're going to show our viewers it's really fancy and um, it can be fancy, but it doesn't have to be. Again, it's really, it looks very fancy, looks but very again, fancy. you know, it's a handful of ingredients, very easy to make at home and healthy. <laughs> awesome. That sounds so good. It sounds refreshing. Is what it, it sounds great. Yes. And it's, a, you know, as you can see, it's a very visually appealing dessert. Um, you hate to eat it, but Deb, eat it, you must. So, <laughs> so Deb, it's almost it's a public service. Fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank you for joining me as always. Thank you for having me. And thank you to our viewers and our listeners. We cannot wait. Until the next time, we see you on the stir. Thank you.